Thank you very much. A very big hello to North Carolina Special Place. You saw the other day my little granddaughter. She's named Carolina. There's for a reason, because Lara, her mother is from here, and she's doing a fantastic job, a fantastic person. So it's great to be here and great to be back in this beautiful state with thousands of proud, hardworking American patriots, which is what you are. I want to thank very much Glenn Mosack and everyone at the Mosack Group for welcoming me today. This is a beautiful, fantastic place. And I must tell you, Glenn is the owner and the boss and all of that, and he grabbed me as I'm coming up. He grabbed me. Sir, I want to just tell you something. He said, before tariffs, when you put those tariffs on, this was just a dead, empty building. It wasn't functioning. And you put those tariffs on, and now we're a manufacturing powerhouse. He said they were only importing product. Now they're making product, and they're making a lot of it. You see a lot of it here. That's a lot of product. And uh, I really, uh, I know that. I've known that for a long time. And that's what we're going to be doing on a much, much larger scale. And our congressmen that are here and senators, a lot of people here, I'll just introduce a couple real fast. But uh, I just want you to know that I, I couldn't have been uh, more beautifully greeted when Glenn said that, because I've been trying to explain that to people. They don't understand it. But this was an, he called it an empty hulk. And now it's a thriving business. We're also joined by — thank you very much. We're also joined by congressional nominees. Mark Harris is doing fantastically well. No relation to Kamala Harris, I don't assume. Uh, where are no, he's not. No, I don't think so. You're doing very well. You're doing better than she is, I can tell you that, in the polls. And Pat Harrigan. Thank you. Good luck, Pat. I heard you both doing great. And, of course, North Carolina GOP Chairman Jason Simmons, who's a fantastic, a fantastic job. I heard we had a great poll this morning. That was good. We're doing well. We've won North Carolina twice, and uh, we got to win it one more time. And uh, we win North Carolina. We're going all the way. Perhaps we go all the way anyway, but this is a very important place, a very important state, and I love it. And uh, as the expression goes, we have family here, and we really do. I also want a big uh, enterprise down the road at Lake Norman. Does anybody know of what I have? And it's been very, very successful. Trump, Trump National has been great right on Lake Norman, which is so beautiful. I wish I had time to go see it. I won't have time to even see it. I got to go in and out. Uh, but uh, I'll be back. As you know, there have been two assassination attempts on my life that we know of, and they may or may not involve, but possibly do, Iran. But I don't really know, can't be sure, because in the first case in Butler, Pennsylvania, great place. And we're going back to Butler, by the way. We're going to go back and finish our speech. The FBI has been unable to open the three potentially foreign-based apps. And in the second case, the assassin had six cell phones in his car, yet the FBI has likewise been unable to penetrate their guard. Shouldn't be tough to do. They want to know, and I want to know, and the whole country and maybe the world wants to know, who is he calling? Who is he calling? In the old days, the FBI and the DOJ used to capture people before anything happened. In current days, the upper echelon of the FBI is all talk while they focus on the sitting president's political opponents. That's what they're doing. They spend so much time. We won the case in Florida. It's all a big scam. It's all against a political opponent, me, who's doing better in the polls than anybody else and should be, hopefully, able to recapture the presidency in 41 days and make our country great again. But all they focus on is their political opponent. But they must get Apple. 
to open these foreign apps, and they must get Apple to likewise open the six phones from the second lunatic, who is a lunatic, and open them immediately because we have a lot at stake, whether it's me or any other former president. They break into apps all the time. They had no problem breaking into the apps of the J6 hostages. They broke into those apps. And they could be Iran-based. They could also be something else. But we'll never know until they're opened, and they got to get them opened. And really, why is it that the father of the shooter in the Butler instance has one of the best and most expensive lawyers in the entire state of Pennsylvania. How did he get to this expensive lawyer, big, big law firm, the biggest in Pittsburgh? Where did he get this big law firm from? It's sort of strange. If I were president and a former president and a leading candidate, I'm the leading candidate by far to be the next president. And that leading candidate was under threat. If I was president and the candidate was under threat, any candidate, Republican or Democrat, and by the way, I want to thank the Democrats because they just increased funding for the Secret Service, who work very hard. They increased funding for the Secret Service. And nobody will believe this. It was a unanimous vote. Republicans, every single Republican, every single Democrat, present voted in favor. That was the first unanimous vote we've seen in a long time, and that's to increase the funding of the Secret Service. So I, I thank everybody in Congress. But if I were the president, I would inform the threatening country, in this case Iran, that if you do anything to harm this person, we are going to blow your largest cities and the country itself to smithereens. We're going to blow it to smithereens. You can't do that. And there would be no more threats. There would be no more threats. But right now, we don't have that leadership or the necessary people, the necessary leaders. We have two people, not one. We don't even know who our president is right now. Who is our president right now? We really don't know, but we have two people, not one that only keep looking. And when you do that, when you just look, trouble always ensues. So it's big trouble for our country. Meanwhile, we have the president of Iran in our country this week. We have large security forces guarding him, and yet they're threatening our former president and the leading candidate to become the next president of the United States. Certainly a strange set of circumstances. Around the world, our enemies are desperate to prevent Donald Trump from returning to the White House because they know I will make America great again. They don't want that. Four years ago, our country was feared and respected, and our country will soon be feared and respected again. We have to have that. And that's why we all need to pull together to thwart these attempts and to bring back American strength, power, and prestige. We will soon have it back. No threat will shake me. No enemy will intimidate me. And I have — I have never been more determined than I am today, and I will never back down in my fight to make America great again, which is what we're doing. So I want to make that statement because we are under threat. I have been threatened uh, very directly, and I appreciate uh, the agencies that we've been meeting with, but we've been threatened very directly by Iran. And I think you have to let them know, because the best way to do it is through the office of the President, that you do any attacks on former presidents or candidates for president, uh, your country gets blown to smithereens, as we say. 41 days from now, we are going to win the state of North Carolina. We are going to defeat comrade Kamala Harris. And we are going to take back our country. We're going to take it back. Yesterday, I was in Georgia, a great place, to outline my plan for 
an American manufacturing renaissance. That's what we're doing. We got tremendous reviews on that speech. Now, today, Kamala Harris is supposedly announcing her so-called plans to support manufacturing and wealth creation. Why didn't she do it three and a half years ago? They've done nothing. Why didn't she do everything three and a half years ago? She's been there for almost four years, and she didn't do it. She didn't create wealth. She destroyed 22 percent of the value of every dollar in your pocket and jeopardized us in front of the remaining portions of the marketplace. And the world's reserve currency is under siege right now. A lot of people think we won't have the reserve currency. If we lose that, that's like the equivalent of losing a war. We will have it. If I'm elected president, we will have the world's reserve currency in better shape and order, and every country will follow it. And if they don't, we will put tariffs on that country, and we won't trade with that country. And they will then call us and say, we would love to have you continue to be the world's reserve currency, sir. So easy. It's so easy, but you need the right messenger. You need the right messenger. She didn't support domestic manufacturing. She killed 24,000 U.S. manufacturing jobs. In the last month alone, we lost 24,000 jobs. You know, there is a reason for the interest rate cut from the Fed. A big part of that reason is that our economy is doing really, really badly. Kamala goes to work every day in the White House. Families are suffering now. So if she has a plan, she should stop grandstanding and do it. Just do it. You have, you have a few months left. Do it. Do it. You have plans for the border? Do it now. You know, you don't need anything at the border. All you need is the President of the United States to say, the border is closed. I didn't have anything. I had, I had only a good thought process. I closed the border. I built hundreds of miles of wall. And I got Mexico to give us thousands of soldiers to guard our country so people didn't come in. And we had the safest border in the history of our country. I didn't need to have a document. I was president. I said to the Border Patrol, nobody better than the Border Patrol and ICE and all of the rest, law enforcement in this country, of which I have the endorsement of almost every single law enforcement group. But Kamala should have closed the border years ago, and we wouldn't have hostile takeovers of Springfield, Ohio, Aurora, Colorado, where they're actually going in with massive machine gun type equipment. They're going in with guns that are beyond even military scope. And they're taking over apartment buildings. They're taking over real estate. They're in the real estate development business. Congratulations. These are, in that case, people from Venezuela, young street gang members that were sent here by the Venezuelan government. You know, crime in Venezuela is way down. Crime all over the world is way down, except here. I was right in the debate when David Muir kept interrupting me over and over and over again. And he said to me, when I said crime is way up, it's rampant because of what's happening in our country. And he said, no, crime is not up. That's a mistake. Crime. Well, the following day, the Department of Justice announced the crime figures up 44 percent, up much more than that in certain categories. But I haven't gotten an apology. No vice president in history has done more damage to the United States economy than Kamala Harris. She has no idea what she's talking about on economy or really on anything else. If you watched Oprah the other day and you watched those answers, you wouldn't even be thinking of her for President of the United States, because we had four years of that, and our country can't take four more years of that, I can tell you. But twice she cast the deciding votes that caused the worst inflation in maybe a hundred years. She abolished our borders and flooded our country with 21 million plus illegal aliens. They came in from all over. Think of it. They came from prisons and jails. 
They came from mental institutions and insane asylums. They're terrorists. They're criminal street gangs. They're MS-13. We took millions of people like this into our country, and we're going to get them out, and we're going to get them out fast, I can tell you. No country can survive that. No country can survive it. But ask yourself, is anything less expensive than it was four years ago? Where are the missing 818,000 jobs? Remember, they said 808. They were fake jobs. And they thought they'd be caught, but they thought it was going to be after the election, not before the election. They had a leaker. Thank you, Mr. Leaker. They had a leaker who leaked the fact that they falsified the numbers. Nobody talks about it. The press refuses to write it. We don't want to hear Kamala's fake promises, even something like she worked very long and hard hours over French fries at McDonald's. She never worked at McDonald's. It was a fake story. It was a fake story. The press now refuses to write it because it's so, you know, there's a very simple one. She said she worked at McDonald's and she didn't. Not highly sophisticated, not complicated. It was a lie. She never worked at McDonald's over the hot French fries. I think I'm going to a McDonald's in two weeks, actually. And I'm going to work the French fries because I will have worked longer and harder at McDonald's than she did if I do that even for half an hour. So we want to hear an apology for all of the jobs and all of the lives that she's destroyed. Think of it. They created 818,000 fake jobs so that the job numbers would look better. But they got caught before the election. They were going to announce it after the election that it was a mistake. It wasn't a mistake. It was fraud. And the Attorney General should look into it because nobody's ever had that kind of a mistake before in this country. 800, almost a million jobs, a mistake. But she got caught. So I just, uh, sometimes these whistleblowers and leakers are okay with me. Kamala Harris is a one-woman economic wrecking ball. And this November, the people of North Carolina are going to tell her we've had enough. We can't take it anymore. Kamala Harris, you're fired. Get out. You fired. You did a lousy job as vice president. Look, Joe is the worst president in the history of our country. Jimmy Carter is the happiest man because the Carter administration, by comparison, was totally brilliant. And Kamala is considered, and if you go back seven weeks, was considered the worst vice president in the history of our country. Now she wants to be president. We can't let it happen. And she's a Marxist. We're not ready for a Marxist president, and we never will be. North Carolina was once the beating heart of American manufacturing. I know it very well. I was here many times to buy furniture for buildings. I'd come and I'd look, and there was nobody like the craftsmen of North Carolina. It was filled with companies like this one and known everywhere for its incredible craftsmanship and skill. I know from personal experience, though, that I was a big buyer. I bought a lot of things here that there was no place for furniture in particular, like North Carolina. You were the furniture capital of the world. But now, so much of that business has been stolen from you, and it's made in China and other places. And by the way, it's not as good. The quality is nowhere near. You made furniture. You bought, you bought a chair. It was good for 30 years. You buy some of these chairs that they sell you now. They break after about two months. People are laying on the floor suing you for giving a bitch. Then on top of it all, our government keeps them out. Then on top of it all, you get sued because they fell out of a chair at a hotel. Boy, oh boy, you made the best product. You made the best furniture. After the twin betrayals of NAFTA, which I ended, and China's entry into the WTO, World Trade, North Carolina lost over 300,000 manufacturing jobs quickly including 60 percent of its furniture manufacturing jobs, and that number was going up until I came along. No one in Washington ever cared until me 
In four short years, I ended NAFTA, the worst trade deal ever made, and replaced it with the USMCA, considered the best trade deal ever made, kept you in business. And I stood up to China like never before, including by imposing a 22 percent tariff on all Chinese furniture imports, saving the North Carolina furniture industry, what was left of it, because when I got there, you were in bad shape. But I saved the rest of the industry from total obliteration, just like Glenn said here. This building was an empty hoax, sir, until you put tariffs on, and now it's thriving. And a lot of people working here. It's a beautiful, beautiful site, beautiful place, great-looking product. Almost overnight, we reduced Chinese furniture imports by 25 percent. And I just want to say to North Carolina, you're welcome. Get out and vote for Trump. That's all I ask. I don't ask much. Vote for Trump, right? These beautiful women are from North Carolina. They have been following me all over the United States for years. This is number 232, and this isn't a rally. This is just a gathering of business people, just letting them know how well we're doing with all of the things that we're doing and how well we're doing in the polls. We're doing very well. We're leading in North Carolina by nice numbers, I think. But uh, the real story is now being told because you're hearing the story. But these women have followed me all over. Their husbands are great people that put up with them. They are all over. Look how beautiful they are. They, and they follow me to California. They follow all over the country. And now, finally, we're in North Carolina. So you don't have to go so far. They live about 20 minutes away. But they are unbelievable patriots, and we appreciate it. There's actually about 50 of them. And I often wonder, you know, they're happily married. They're great, great people. They're happily, happily married. But boy, their husbands, I say, darling, I'm leaving for a couple of days. We're going on. He's going, you're going to watch him again? But we love you and we appreciate it. And above all else, they're patriots. They want to see our country get better. So thank you. Thank you very much. So to the workers of this state, when you hear Kamala Harris attack my tariffs today, you wouldn't have anything left at this state if I didn't do what I did. This building would be now shuttered, closed, empty, no jobs, and now it's thriving. We're going to do the same thing on a very large scale for our country. We're going to make our country something that nobody thought it was even possible. Just remember, Kamala's not attacking me. She's attacking your furniture jobs. She's attacking your communities. She's attacking your factories. And she's trying to send all of those jobs to China with everything else. And we're not going to let that happen. Joe, Joe got all that money for China. You know, China paid him a lot of money. So did Ukraine. So did Russia. They got a lot of money. Remember when I said during the debate, when Chris Wallace was the host, he did not so How's Chris Wallace doing lately? Not too good, right? He's not doing too good. I said, why did the mayor of Russia's wife pay you three and a half million dollars cash? How come? And Chris Wallace stopped me. You're not supposed to be asking that question. I said, why not? That's a question. He wouldn't let it be asked. You know, I had three on one the other day, and I had two on one then. I always have Unequal odds, but we handled it very well. We got great marks on that debate. We got a, We had a woman debating. She just talked about, like, the birds and the bees. She didn't talk about when you asked a question. There was never an answer. There was never any knowledge. When you saw her the other day, and by the way, when she did the interview previous with the Pennsylvania person, who was a nice person, I know him very well, they were the softest questions. She was unable, literally unable, to answer the questions. And we can't have that. We cannot have it. We need four strong years. We have to bring our country back. Under my plan, American workers will no longer be worried about losing your jobs to foreign nations. Instead, foreign nations will be worried about losing their jobs to America. You've never heard that before. And you've never heard that before, I don't think. 
We're going to take their jobs, we're going to take their factories, and we're going to bring trillions and trillions of dollars in wealth back to the USA and back to North Carolina. A lot of those jobs, especially those furniture jobs, they're going to be coming back. It's uh, not overly complicated, and we're going to explain it. And it's what many countries have done to us for years and years and years. And we uh, didn't do it because we didn't have the leadership necessary to understand what was going on. Here is the deal that I will be offering to every major company and manufacturer within our country. I will give you the lowest taxes, the lowest energy costs. I will cut your energy in half. The lowest regulatory burden and free access to the best and biggest market on the planet Earth. But only if you make your product here in America and hire American workers for the job. You know, you know, I had Wall Street geniuses calling me up yesterday. I said this yesterday when I was in Georgia, where we're leading also, by the way, that's nice, by quite a bit. But we we're in Georgia and doing well. And they called me up after the speech and they said, what? Who gave you that idea to cut the taxes, but only if you make the product in the USA? Pretty good idea. They said, who gave you that idea? I said, I did. If you don't make your product here, then you will have to pay a tariff when you send your product into the United States. And we will take in hundreds of billions of dollars into our Treasury and use that money to benefit American citizens. But really, what's going to happen is they're going to end up building their factory here so they don't have to pay the tariff. That's really what's going to happen, most of it. But when they don't, we're going to take in a lot of money. Every once in a while in business, you'll look at a company and say, how is it possible that I can buy this company? This company's great. Happens. I've had it happen a lot. Actually, I've done a lot of them. But the other side looks and doesn't understand why you're so thrilled. And that's the way I view the incredible potential of the United States. This is a profit-generating machine that's been horribly run by either corrupt or very stupid politicians. And it's been allowed to be dissipated, absolutely dissipated. But it's like a company that you see it, you buy it, you change it, and you make a fortune. And oftentimes, the seller of those companies will come back to me and come back to others and say, why the hell didn't I see that? Happens. I've had a lot of jobs like that. You take it, and it becomes a tremendous success. And the seller would call me and say, congratulations. I never saw what you saw. You know, they talk about the paperclip. The paperclip is a very simple thing. A lot of people say, gee, why didn't I think of that? The United States of America is going to be by far the most successful country anywhere in the world. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to do things that nobody will believe. And it's so simple, and it's going to happen fast. We're going to do great things for the citizens of our country. We're going to make an absolute fortune for the American people. I think it's okay to say that. It's about time, because we've been given and giving away our country to foreign countries for so long. They've been ripping us off for so long. And now it's going to be the exact opposite. And we're not going to rip them off. We're just going to take back what was ours and then some. The centerpiece of my plan for a manufacturing renaissance will be a 15 percent made in America tax rate. You have to make it in America. So the tax rate is going down to 15 percent if your product is made in America, like this product is made in America. So I brought the business tax rate from 39 percent to 21 percent, the biggest decrease, biggest cut in taxes in the history of our country. And people said, that that was impossible to get done, but I got it done, and I got it actually passed in Congress, so it cannot be changed easily, even though they want to change it and raise it way back up and lose all your jobs. 
If she gets in, they're going to want to make it 38, 40, maybe even 50 percent. I got it done. I got it approved in Congress. And we did more business and created more jobs during that period than at any time in our country's history. Now I'm taking it a step further. We're going to bring the 21 percent rate, which everyone said we could never get, down to 15 percent, but only if you manufacture your product here in the USA, just like you did when you were the furniture capital of the world. That's why those furniture cap those furniture companies, and you still have your craftsmen here, unfortunately, they're doing other jobs that they don't want to be doing. They love making furniture. I know the furniture guys. They don't want to be doing other jobs. They want to be making furniture. They're artists. Those people are going to be coming back into the furniture business. Then, next, I'm imposing tariffs on your competition from foreign countries, all these foreign com countries that have ripped us off, which stole all of your businesses and all of your jobs years ago and took your businesses out so that now they won't be able to compete with North Carolina or businesses in any other state in our once great country, soon to be greater than ever before country. All of your furniture makers are going to come back and come back bigger and stronger and better than ever before. They're mostly gone. They're all coming back. This is why people in countries want to kill me. They're not happy with me. It is. It's a risky business. This is why they want to kill me. They only kill consequential presidents, remember that. But this is why, if you're one of the countries that's affected, you're not happy with what I'm saying. When they used to say they like Barack Hussein Obama, of course they do, because he did nothing to help us. When they like Biden, who doesn't know he's alive, of course they like him, because he does nothing to bring your businesses back. He lets the world rob our country, the robber barons. He lets them rob and steal from our country. And most importantly, he lets them take our jobs. U.S.-based manufacturers will also be able to write off 100 percent of the cost of heavy machinery and other equipment in the fiscal year. So you got the greatest thing in the world. You're going to have protection from them coming in because we're going to put on from 50 to 200 percent tariffs. You're going to be protected. Your companies are going to come in. They're going to pay a low tax rate and a really low tax rate if they make their product in America, which is what we want to do because we're creating jobs like no other country would be able to create jobs. By contrast, Listen to the deal that Kamala Harris is offering to companies to keep jobs in America. First, the tax queen, they call it the tax queen because she's a big tax raiser, is demanding a 33 percent tax hike on all domestic production. That means those companies are leaving. That's all it means. You know, these are companies that are smart and they owe it to their shareholders or their families or whoever owns the company. They'll leave. They have to leave. So she wants to increase their taxes. They're already leaving, and she wants to increase. That means they're gone. Do we agree, North Carolina? The ladies of North Carolina agree. That's not a tough one, though. You've had tougher questions than that. No, they want to, she wants to raise the taxes on businesses, so now they can all leave. Next, she wants the largest capital gains tax in the history of our country. And then she is promising a brand new wealth confiscation tax or unrealized capital gains tax. In other words, unrealized. You know what that means? That means, you know, a lot of people are rich, but they don't have cash because they're spending it in their business and other things. That means they're going to have to sell their business in order to get cash because you're, she's taxing you and you haven't done anything. The only one going to make a lot of money are going to be the appraisers, the accountants, and the lawyers. That will drive our country into a depression like in 1929. In addition, Kamala is shutting down power plants nationwide, causing electricity prices to soar by more than 100 percent. You know, your energy costs are much too high right now. 
and she's going to be lifting them by at least 100 percent, and she'll close down all fracking and all fossil fuel development. She's been saying it for years. So she had 15 different policies that she's changed. And over the years, I've been, you know, into politics, but mostly on the other side, like writing checks for politicians, campaign contributions, extremely legal. But I've been on the other side, campaign contributions. And I've seen on occasion a politician make one change in policy, maybe two. She's made 15. She wants to confiscate your guns. She wants to do this. She wants to do that. She wants absolutely there will be no fracking. She said it all over the place. You got to see 2018, 2019, there will be no fracking in this. Now she's saying, oh, fracking would be fine. She was in charge of the defund the police movement. You know, she's a radical left person. Her father is a Marxist professor. He teaches. He teaches what his daughter is now trying to teach you. No, we don't want Marxists to be running our country because it's a short way to. Uh, well, so oh no, we pass socialism. We never had socialism. I always said we will not ever be a socialist country, and I was right because they skipped socialism. They went down to communism. They, I was right. Got to keep myself right. No, we skip socialism. This is unbelievable that this woman is running. She's a communist. Her views are communist. She destroyed San Francisco. The greatest city in this country 15, 20 years ago was San Francisco. She destroyed San Francisco as DA. She destroyed California as the attorney general. She was attorney general of California. She destroyed it. Most beautiful place on earth best weather, beautiful ocean, and everything. And now you look at it, look at what it's done. And Newscom, Gavin Newscom, has done a terrible job. He's a terrible governor. She's destroyed it, and she'll destroy the United States of America if she becomes president. And all those things that she wanted, you know, a politician always goes back to where they came from, defund the police. Think of it. She headed up to fund the police for her years. She was one of the originators of defund the police. Anybody that wants to defund the police and is a party to that even for one day has no right to be the President of the United States. Right? Under my plan, we will cut energy and electricity prices in half, not only for businesses, but for our great young ladies from North Carolina. Your prices, they're pretty rich people, I think. I don't think it's going to matter to them, but it's going to matter to a lot. Will cutting the energy prices mean anything to you ladies? Still good, right? It's money. But we're going to cut it in half, not only for your businesses, but for everybody. Within 12 months, we will double our electricity capacity to compete with China and other countries on artificial intelligence. You know, people don't know the AI, artificial intelligence, is a big thing. Everybody wants it. China is already building massive electric plants. To be able to compete, you need more than double the electricity that you already have in this country or you can't compete. It is an electricity-eating monster. And we're going to be able to do that, and we'll be more than able to compete. We're going to be able to get it done, but not if somebody else is president. It'll be a disaster. To slash burdens on workers and businesses, we will cut 10 old regulations for every one new regulation. So I cut more regulations during my four-year term than any other president in history during any term. And we're going to keep it going. Some of them have been put back by Biden and Harris. And to the auto workers of our country, we love you. I am pinpointing you for greatness. China is right now building major auto plants in Mexico. They didn't start them with me. They knew that it wasn't going to work with me. As soon as I left, they started building. And they think they're going to sell their cars into the United States and destroy Michigan. South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia, a lot of other places where they make autos or auto parts. 
And it's not going to happen. We will put a 100 percent tariff on every single car that they want to come across our border and tell them only that they'll get rid of the tariff under one circumstance if you build your plant, not in Mexico, but into the United States and use our people as your workers. I will bring automobile manufacturing back to the highest level in the history of our country. We will be like it was 50 years ago when there was virtually nobody else to compete with us. We're going to bring back the automobile manufacturing at a level that we haven't seen before in many, many years, maybe never. Vote Trump and you will see a mass exodus of manufacturing from China to Pennsylvania. You haven't heard that too much. From Germany to Georgia, from South Korea to North Carolina, you're going to see a tremendous exodus the other way. You haven't seen that. We were getting ready to do it, and then a lot of bad things happened. We did much better, by the way, in the election of 2020 than we did in 2016. Just remember that. Millions and millions of votes more. More votes than any sitting president in the history of our country. But they beat us by a whisker. They beat us just by a little whisker. He beat us from the basement. As we save our economy, we will also seal the border and stop the migrant invasion into our country. It's the greatest invasion that we've ever had into our country. What they've done to our country is incredible, and what they're doing to our country. Under Border Czar Harris, millions and millions of people are pouring in right now from all over the world, prisons, jails, insane asylums, mental institutions, terrorists, all at record levels. We've never had anything like this. And, you know, I, I feel so sorry for the towns and the cities where they are. They're causing havoc, and the mayors always want to be politically correct. One particular — I don't want to embarrass him, but one particular mayor is saying, we're looking for translators because the people speak no English. So they're looking — you shouldn't be looking for translators. You should be looking for people to take them out of our country and bring them back from where they came, because your town and city is being destroyed. The 21 million illegals she let in are now creating havoc throughout the country. Aurora, Colorado, and Springfield, Ohio are just two examples. What they're going through in those places, it's unbelievable. I mean, they're literally taking over those towns, and they're taking over hundreds — those are two years — hundreds of towns and cities throughout our country, including the big ones. Look at New York. All of the people, what's happened to the quality of life? The quality of life is a whole different deal. Chicago, take a look at what's happening in Chicago. Look at L.A. Look at what's happening in Los Angeles. They're taking over your cities, your big ones, your small ones, your towns. It's not sustainable by anybody. Yet after almost four years, border czar Kamala Harris has reportedly decided that for political reasons, that it's finally time for her to visit the southern border. So she — think of it. She was the border czar. For almost four years, she's never been there. She went to one little area, but it was — I'd like to go there, too, with our great First Lady and have a nice lunch. This was not the border that she should be looking at. I can tell you the real border, because I've been there many times. She finally went after almost four years. And the reason is because her polls are crashing. She's not doing well, because I don't believe the people of this country are stupid. I think they're very smart. And you're not going to let her ruin this country like she did San Francisco or Los Angeles. She ruined the entire state of California. She's trying to con the public. But remember, she is the one who terminated Remain in Mexico. I had a policy. It was not easy to get with the president of Mexico, who I got along with great, but he is a smart man, and he took advantage of our country. I said, we have to have Remain in Mexico. He looked at me like I was crazy. I said, no, 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 I'm not. I want remain in Mexico until we find out if these people are qualified to come in. And they stayed in Tijuana. They stayed all over Mexico. Hundreds of thousands of people 
and we took him in very, very slowly. I don't know if they can put up my world's favorite chart. I don't know. I don't know. We're in a factory right now. We don't have billboards, I don't think. But the way, the greatest chart, I love that chart because that chart saved my life. It was a chart on immigration. It was a chart on immigration, blue, gold, and red. I love it very much. If I didn't have that chart, I probably wouldn't be speaking to you right now. But it shows, basically, that we had the best and lowest immigration numbers, and that included drugs and human trafficking and a lot of other things that we've ever had in the history of our country. So remain in Mexico. They canceled our asylum agreements with Central American nations ended Title 42, a very important program, implemented nationwide catch and release. I had catch and release, but I catch and release in Mexico. We catch and release into the United States, never to see these people again until they murder somebody and then we see them. And we allowed them, through absolute stupidity, to destroy the very fabric of our nation. Millions of people were allowed to come in totally unvetted, totally unchecked, from places unknown. I was with Tom Homan recently. He told me that the last check was they came in from 168 different countries. Most people don't even know there are that many countries. Actually, there are quite a bit more than that. 168 countries were represented with illegal aliens coming in from the Congo and Africa. They come in a lot from the Congo, from jails in the Congo. They open their jails from South America, Venezuela, all of the countries. They're letting them out of their prisons and jails. They're letting them out. Their jail population's way down. Their mental institution population. But this is all over the world. They come from the Middle East. They come from Asia. They come from parts of Europe. They come into our country. Many of them are major, major criminals, murderers. When Kamala speaks about the border, her credibility is less than zero. I hope you're going to remember that on Friday when she tells you about the border. Ask her just one simple question. Why didn't you do it four years ago? Why didn't you do it four years ago? They've got very little time left, thank God. Very little time left. Why? It's all you have to do. I give this to the fake news media because they don't cover it properly. They don't even talk about the border. Say, why didn't you do it four years ago when you first came in? Why are you waiting three and a half, almost four years? Kamala's migrant invasion has particularly devastated the black community and the Hispanic community, including all of the people, the jobs, what they've done. The jobs are going to illegal migrants that came into our country illegally. Our black population all over the country, our Hispanic population, are losing their jobs. They're citizens of America. They're losing their jobs. Most of the jobs that were created in our country, and all of the jobs, almost all, were bounce back. They, were, they came from me. Bounce back. Every pandemic has a big bounce back at the end of a pandemic. And we had a very quick bounce back. And we did a great job on the pandemic. Never got the credit I got for the military. We rebuilt it. We beat ISIS very quickly, very rapidly. They said it was going to take five years to beat ISIS. ISIS was defeated in four weeks. Our military is great. And outside of some of the people on the top, I know every one of them, outside of those people, our military is not woke. You could put some of these people into a room and scream at them for two years, and they'd walk out of that room. They wouldn't be woke. We have a great military, and they proved that with the defeat of ISIS. So last month, American-born workers lost 1.3 million jobs. This is last month. And of the 1.3 million jobs, migrants, illegal people that came in illegally into our country, got 635,000 jobs. They got more jobs than anybody else. 
the black population and the Hispanic population is being devastated by Biden and Kamala Harris, by these millions of people that are coming into our country. And unions will be next. You watch. The unions are going to be devastated by this. And I've been right about everything. You know, they have a hat. Trump was right about everything. I actually was right about everything, right? In the Republican Party, which has become the party of common sense, we believe that American jobs should go to American citizens, not illegal aliens. We believe that strongly. And that's one more reason why we begin the largest deportation operation in American history, starting with the criminals, the murderers, the drug dealers, the people from prisons. We're going to get them out of our country. We're going to get them out fast. The terrorists. We have record numbers of terrorists. In 2019, Border Patrol reported not one terrorist came into the country under the Trump administration. I don't even believe that could be possibly correct. But that's what they say, zero. Over a period of years, they said 11 came in. Let me tell you, right now, we have more terrorists coming, thousands, coming into our country than we've ever even thought possible. And these are rough terrorists. These are the real deal. And only bad is going to happen. Starting on day one, we will end inflation and make America affordable again. We will have no tax on tips, no tax on overtime, and no tax on Social Security for our great seniors who have been devastated by inflation. Our seniors have been devastated by inflation. We're going to have no tax on Social Security for our seniors. If any senior doesn't vote for Trump, we're going to have to send you to a psychiatrist to have your head examined. And while working Americans catch up, we're going to put a temporary cap on credit card interest rates at 10 percent. People are paying 22 percent, 25. It's not fair. We're going to put a temporary cap at 10 percent. I will settle. The war in Ukraine, oh, what a problem, what a horrible. This is a war that would have never happened. October 7th in Israel would have never happened. But I will end the chaos in the Middle East quickly. And I'm the only one that's going to do this. We have never been so close to World War III as we are right now. We are so close. I will be sure that World War III will not happen. I'm the only one can say it. Won't happen. But you're very close. So that'll be a war like no other, because I always say, it's not going to be two army tanks, two tanks, which, by the way, our country wants to convert to electric. I'm not going to let that happen. They want electric tanks. They don't work well. The battery size is so big, you're going to have to pull a trailer behind the tank. No, can you believe this? They want electric tanks. They don't care. They want to have a nice, free, beautiful for the environment as we blast our way through countries. These people are crazy. They're crazy. You know, they want electric trucks, even though a diesel-fueled truck can go from New York to Los Angeles with plenty of fuel left over. An electric truck, which weighs two and a half times as much because the battery is so heavy, which takes about half of the payload in addition to the battery itself, takes half of the payload. It has to stop approximately six to seven times. In the Midwest, you just saw Biden. They built battery chargers, eight of them. They spent $9 billion on eight chargers. Uh, it's not going to work. And I'm all for electric. And I like Elon Musk. Elon gave me a tremendous endorsement, a very heartfelt endorsement. He feels that if I'm not elected, this country is finished. And he makes a great car, Tesla. He makes a great, great car. But you know what? If people want a Tesla, I think it's great. But they also want to have gasoline-powered cars, which is an advantage for our country because we have more gasoline than any place else. We have more liquid gold under our feet than any place else if they want a hybrid. And nobody understands that better than Elon Musk. And he makes a great product, but not everybody wants that. They want to have choice. 
These people want you to go all electric within a very short period of time. Will never work. It will never be accepted. And it's not being accepted. I will terminate that mandate on day one. Look at the war in Ukraine, and I think it's something we have to have a quick discussion about because the President of Ukraine is in our country, and he's making little nasty aspersions toward your favorite President, me. But take a look at the war happening right now in Ukraine. It would have never happened if I were President to start off with. And there didn't even have to be a settlement. It wouldn't have happened, period. Russia wouldn't have gone in. I spoke to Putin about it a lot. I got along very well with Putin. I spoke to him a lot. You know, I was the one that ended the pipeline, Nord Stream 2, in Europe, going to Germany. And uh, he said, that was a bad thing. That was the biggest job. Then they say how nice I was to Russia. No, I wasn't nice. But we got along. We had a good relationship, which is a good thing, not a bad thing. But what's happening in Ukraine is a very serious matter. Let's say we did settle, and a deal would have been made with Russia years ago, three years ago, before it all began. And we could have made a deal easily. Could have made it easily. If we had a president who was intelligent, we could have made a deal easily. But what do you have left now, right? Three years of horrible fighting. The country is absolutely obliterated. Millions and millions of people, including all of these great soldiers, they're dead. Those gorgeous buildings with golden towers are demolished and laying broken on their side. And you'll never see that kind of a town or city again can never be duplicated. They're all demolished other than Kiev. You'll never be able to rebuild the cities or towns the way they are impossible to do. They were thousands of years old. And just think about it. Just three years ago, you had a beautiful civilization. Millions of people that were living that are now not with us any longer. Magnificent towns and cities that were so beautiful could never be reconstructed, other than Kiev, which is actually starting to be hit right now. He wanted to save that. Most of the country is gone. The heritage is gone. So many people are dead. Many people have left for Poland, for Hungary, and for other places, never to return. And that includes Many, many Russian soldiers are dead. A deal could have been made. There wouldn't have been one person that died, and there wouldn't have been one golden tower laying shattered on its side. A deal could have been made if we had a competent president instead of a president that egged it all on. And Biden and Kamala allowed this to happen by feeding Zelensky money and munitions like no country has ever seen before. Every time he came to our country, he'd walk away with $60 billion. He's probably the greatest salesman on Earth. But now, Ukraine is running out of soldiers. They're using young children and old men because their soldiers are dying and other things are happening to them that we won't even discuss. So many are badly injured. Now, what do you have? What deal can we make? What deal can we make? The, the, it's, it's demolished. The people are dead. The country is in rubble. And who are these people that allowed this to happen? Who are these people? I said, don't let it happen. This never happened in my four years. I told President Putin, you're not going to do it. He would never have done it. They started to form after I left. And I actually thought they were forming as a negotiating tactic for Putin. I thought it was a negotiation. But through a lot of bad statements and stupid statements, he went in. And he's no angel. It's all such a horror. Biden and Harris caused this situation, by the stupidity of what they said,
by every move they make. But they caused the situation, and now they're locked in. They're locked in. I watched this poor guy yesterday at the United Nations. He didn't know what he was saying. They just don't know what to do. They're locked into a situation. It's sad. They just don't know what to do. Because Ukraine is gone. It's not Ukraine anymore. You can never replace those cities and towns, and you can never replace the dead people, so many dead people. Any deal, even the worst deal, would have been better than what we have right now. If they made a bad deal, it would have been much better. They would have given up a little bit, and everybody would be living, and every building would be built, and every tower would be aging for another 2,000 years. And it will only get worse with these people. With Kamala doesn't even — she doesn't know what she's doing. More people will die. More cities will fall. The ones that fell will continue to receive more and more bombs. They'll be broken up asunder, worse than they are right now. Nothing is standing. The crops are dying. There's really nothing for the Ukrainian people to move back to. And it didn't need to happen. Those buildings are down. Those cities are gone. They're gone. And we continue to give billions of dollars to a man who refuses to make a deal, Zelensky. There was no deal that he could have made that wouldn't have been better than the situation you have right now. You have a country that has been obliterated not possible to be rebuilt. It'll take hundreds of years to rebuild it. There's not enough money to rebuild it if the whole world got together. They're not going to be satisfied until they send American kids over to Ukraine, and that's what they're trying to do. And the moms and dads of America don't want their kids fighting Ukraine and Russia. And we're not going to have our soldiers die across the ocean. I will restore, as I did for four years, the only president in 81 years, they say. No wars. Hillary Clinton said, look at him, look at him. He'll immediately start wars. No. Then she said, look at his rhetoric. He's going to start wars. I said, no, my rhetoric is going to keep us out of wars. And that's what happened. I kept you out of wars. My rhetoric kept you out of wars. I stopped wars from happening. If it were somebody else, they would have gotten five Nobel Prizes. I never even got a mention, and I wouldn't, because I happen to be a different kind of a person, and the fake news treats me much differently than they treat other people. Obama got a Nobel Peace Prize, and he didn't even do it. He said, why did I get it? He had no idea. It was immediate as soon as he walked into office, practically. He didn't do anything. What I've done is incredible. The Abraham Accords alone, incredible. But they haven't done anything with it. We would have had every country just about in the Middle East signed into the Abraham Accords, but the Abraham Accords brought peace. We would have had total peace in the Middle East. But I don't care about that with the Nobel Prize. I had so many people, you should get the Nobel Prize. I said, don't worry about it. They don't get the Nobel Prize to certain people. But these are the people that get things done. These are the people that understand strength, and they understand peace, because we will restore peace through strength. We will rebuild our cities, including Washington, D.C., making them safe, clean, and beautiful again. We will keep the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency. This is how we will end the era of inflation, mayhem, and misery under Kamala and Crooked Joe and unleash safety, prosperity, and peace for Americans of every race, religion, color, and creed. We're going to do things for our people that haven't been done for a very long time. And we started four years ago. We were doing things that nobody ever believed, jobs and 
We had the greatest economy in the history of our country four years ago, seven years ago, six years ago, and five years ago. Together, we will deliver low taxes, low regulations, low energy costs, low interest rates, low inflation, so that everyone can afford groceries, a car, and a home, the American dream. We will stop the invasion and end migrant crime, support our great police, strengthen our military, build a missile defense shield over our country, keep critical race theory and transgender insanity the hell out of our schools, and we will keep men out of women's sports. We will defend the Second Amendment, restore free speech, and we will secure once and for all our elections. Our elections are under siege. Everyone will prosper, every family will thrive, and every day will be filled with opportunity and with hope. But for that to happen, we must defeat Kamala Harris, and we must stop her country-destroying liberal agenda once and for all. It has to end. We have to bring our country and take our country back. So get everyone you know and vote. We want a landslide that's too big to rig. Very simple. Too big to rig. On November 5th, we will save our economy, we will save our country. It will go down as the most important day in the history of our country. We will rescue our middle class. We will reclaim our sovereignty and restore our borders. We will put America first all the time, and we will take our country back. North Carolina, get out to vote. Thank you. God bless you. And God bless America. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.